Welcome to part three of my van build. We're going to be doing all of the cabinetry, building a desk and cladding the ceiling and walls. My aim is to get all of that built, pre-installed and ready for paint by the end of this episode. So we better get into it. We're actually starting off with a bit of video editing time travel to the historic times of the middle of last episode when I had a day where I was waiting for parts to arrive for the electrical system. So I figured it was a good time to destroy my continuity and throw up some sound deadening. The idea here is to dull the resonance from some of the larger panels by sticking this dense foam to them. I'm only putting it on the worst offending spots because the insulation I'll be putting in later will also do a ton for blocking out noise, so I didn't really see the point in getting too carried away here. I'm going to be attaching 12mm or half inch plywood battens to the interior of the van to act as wall framing. I'd normally use a table saw to cut a bunch of strips like this, but at this point in time, it's still broken. So the track saw got called in. It's pretty slow going because you have to move the track after every cut, but it does do a reasonable job if that's all you've got. I'm using self tapping sheet metal screws to fasten the battens to the wall of the van, so I need to pre-drill a hole for the screw, but then I can just drive the screw in and it'll thread itself into the metal. I tossed up installing rivnuts nuts and then bolting the battens to those, but I decided that that was going to take way too long and was kind of overkill for this application. The use of that 12mm ply here is very intentional, as anything thicker I found didn't conform well to the slight curve of the van's wall, and obviously anything thinner wouldn't be thick enough to screw into later, which is kind of the whole point of adding this framing in, but we'll do more with this later because we're back on the main timeline now where I'd finished the pullout bed and installing the off-grid electrical system. If you haven't seen that yet, it's all in the previous episode that you can check out if you want. As I'm cutting down the plywood, let me show you the kitchen cabinet I'm going to be building. I started the design by measuring up the largest components I knew I needed to fit in there. The first of those is two 25 litre water containers. One's for fresh water and the other one's for grey water and they're connected to the sink. And I wanted to be able to lift them both in and out for filling and emptying from the sliding door opening, which means they need to be located exactly here. The next thing is the chest fridge, which is extremely awkward to place because it opens from the top. There's not enough room to have it go down here, but there is enough above the wheel well. So I figured I could make it slide out on drawer slides and then open up, which also works well ergonomically. I could then model up the cabinet structure around those components, trying to use up as little space as possible. I was trying to be clever and have this little wing desk area, but later in the build I get rid of that because it, it doesn't make any sense, so just ignore that. You'll notice in the CAD model I didn't really get too detailed with exact measurements. If I was getting the CNC cut I obviously would have spent more time on it, but because I'm going to be cutting and measuring anyway, I find it easier just to make those final decisions when I've got everything in front of me. Which is why I'm building the drawer box that holds the fridge first before the rest of the cabinet, because it has the smallest amount of tolerance for error, so it's the most crucial measurement for basing everything else off. I'm using the same 12mm ply glued and screwed together. And while I did full height sides on the drawer for the drawer slides to attach to, I didn't need to do that on the front and back, so to save weight and also increase airflow, I just did slats. I also cut notches for the lid and where the cooling fan is. This fridge weighs around 15 kg, so I need to be a little conscious of the structure of the drawer so it doesn't want to sag. Now back onto the main cabinet carcass. With their length confirmed by the fridge drawer dimensions, I can now cut the stretches and notch the uprights for the stretches to sit in. Building a thing bigger than your workbench always gets a little tricky so I'm doing it in stages. This section here is the side that will have the fridge going in so I'm focusing on getting that right first. And here's that little desk wing that we're ignoring. My original idea with that was to have a desk for my laptop that I could sit at and then have another more heavy duty workbench on the opposite side of the van that I could use for building stuff on. Turns out that was a pretty redundant use of space, so now the plan is just to make one big desk area, and we'll be doing that later on in this episode. These are the drawer slides for the fridge drawer. I'm going to be using two on each side to help spread the load more evenly, because this cabinet carcass is extremely lightweight compared to how normal kitchen cabinets are built. So I'm hoping this will stop or at least mitigate the chance of any warping happening over time. Instead of measuring exactly where they needed to line up on the drawer box, I figured it'd be easier to put the bottom set in first and then just mark in place where the top ones wanted to sit. Now I'm focusing on the side of the cabinet where the water containers and the sink go, so I've brought that into the van so I can double check that they'll fit. And then continue with adding the rest of the bracing in. 
I'm making a little cubby for the portable gas stove I'll be using, which I've got in situ there with the hinges, so I can see how wide I need to make it. Which leaves me with a space next to it that I want to use to make a cutlery drawer. So I quickly made a drawer box for that. Again, I'm using 12mm ply. Because it's such a small drawer, I could have saved some weight by going with a 6mm drawer bottom instead, but I don't have any on hand, so it is what it is. And again, I'm installing the same full extension draw slides. Over at the water container end of the cabinet, I'm checking that the huge sink I got actually fits. And then I'm trimming up the floor so that I can make a support piece that fits into the footwell. I decided the neatest way of doing this would be to scribe a block into that weirdly shaped edge, so I made this little jig from a piece of scrap wood to get the profile to cut out. Which I most definitely didn't cut the wrong bit off and have to entirely redo. This black piece of plywood is a heavy piece of high pressure laminate which I had lying around. I'm using it here because it's going to give me a decent amount of strength for supporting the weight of the water containers and the extra density of the plies is going to be better for screwing into the end grain without fear of them pulling out or splitting, which is something you need to watch out for when you're using the lighter plywoods like that pine I'm normally using. I screwed the scriber blocks onto it along with some extra brackets and then mounted the whole thing into the footwell. And it was this exact moment in time I realized I hated that mini desk idea. I want to undermount my sink so it needs to be flush with the top of the cabinet carcass so I can just screw the bench top on over top later. I bolstered out the stretcher with a few bits of scrap wood to give the router a flat surface to ride on and used the straight flute cutter with the guide to rebate the surface. and also added a brace under the flange of the remaining side for good measure. With the structure of the carcass now finished, I could attach all the front panels. Starting with the drawer fronts, which I fanged a couple of screws in from the back side. The cubby for the gas stove gets a couple of spring-loaded 90 degree hinges, which close harder than a real estate agent before Christmas. For the bigger cupboard doors, I wanted to use concealed Euro-style hinges, except they're designed to be used with panels thicker than 15 millimeters. And because I was using 12 millimeter ply to save on weight, I needed to get a little creative. I did a few test pieces and found I could add a packer to the inside of the panel to give enough depth for the hinge cup to fit, but that didn't really fix the geometry of the hinge itself, so I also needed to notch out where the hinge was if I wanted it to sit flush. In hindsight, I absolutely should have just gone with thicker panels, but since I'd already figured out how to do it, I just stuck with it. Back outside, I added a removable panel using pocket holes to give me access when it comes time to install the plumbing system. This panel is going to be both access to the water containers and a fold down table for when you're sitting outside. And I'm using a piano hinge for it, partially for strength but mostly for looks as the barrel of the hinge is going to be super visible as soon as you open the sliding door. Install is pretty straightforward, I just shim the sides to give myself even clearance and dropped a few screws in. I subtracted a hole for a finger pull and installed a magnetic latch to hold the panel in place. I'm going to be adding some adjustable stays to hold the panel horizontal as a table, but I'll do that after I've done all the painting. I didn't want handles sticking out on the cabinet because it's already such a tight space I'd probably hit my knees on them or something, so I'm just putting simple holes in as pulls for the two taller cupboard doors, and then for all the other ones I 3D printed a router template. which worked really well. I've got an idea for 3D printing some hidden latches to keep everything shut while the van's moving, but again, I'll sort that out after everything's gone through paint. The front of the fridge drawer also needs a hole for the fan intake, which I got a little carried away with. With all the fronts back on, it's time for the bench top, and I just bought a pre-made one from the store. I have a bunch of timber that was rescued from a 150 year old church renovation that's just screaming at me to get used for this. The only catch is, it's full of nails. Once I've got one reasonably straight clean edge, I can run that against the fence of the table saw to get the other side parallel. I'm guessing this is either Rimu or Matai, which are New Zealand native species, but if you know, drop me a comment. I'm cutting each board in two passes going halfway through on each side. It's a little easier to manage that way when you've got a little saw like this one, though it does take a while. 
By the evening, I had a pretty good stash of boards. The next day, I chose the pieces I wanted for the bench top. I squared up the edges and ran them through my thicknesser to get them as flat as possible. The thicknesser is one of those tools where I don't use it often and it's kind of expensive, but it really is such a huge time saver that it's completely worth getting if you plan on doing any type of solid timber woodworking. Because these boards are quite narrow, I'm going to glue them up in two lots. It's going to take longer, but it means I'll have more control to make sure I get everything perfect. Because while it might look straightforward to stick a few boards together, I've messed this up enough times to know there's a bunch of little gotchas that can really ruin your day if you try and rush this. Assuming that all your edges are straight and parallel to one another, the main things I'm watching out for is cupping caused by the pressure of the bark lamps and any up and down slip between the boards. Either one of those things is going to mean a lot more work later to make the bench top nice and flat. Once the second lot of boards is glued up, I can glue both sides together into one large board. You might notice it's looking a little short to cover the whole kitchen cabinet, and that's because instead of cutting the hole for the sink out of the finished bench top, I'm actually gluing it up to go around it. With the glue dry now, I can plane down the surface. I didn't get carried away getting the underside of the bench perfect since no one but us will ever see it, I just made sure it was flat. But I did try and get the top side as nice as I could off the plane because that'll save on needing to do a ton of sanding later. I marked out the precise hole for the sink and cut that out, and then glued a final piece in to be kind of like a splashback and thicken up that back edge by the sink that had gotten kind of thin now. Because of all those nails I pulled out, the bench top currently has more holes in it than the plot of a B-grade horror movie, so I sealed up the back side and mixed some black epoxy to fill them in. After cleanup and a little sanding, I could finally finish the bench top by applying finish to the bench top. <laughs> I'm using a mix of white spirits and oil based polyurethane to make some homebrew wipe on poly. I thought about using special food safe finish but I'd rather have the durability of polyurethane and do my food prep on washable chopping boards like I normally do. I won't be installing it until after I've painted the kitchen cabinet and because I want to paint everything all at once once everything's built, I'm moving on to the next thing which is going to be my work desk. And I'm going to build it using the rest of the timber that I cut down. I prepped another set of boards and started gluing them up into another bench top for the desk. I don't have any weird cutouts to deal with this time, so other than that, it's the exact same process as before. Instead of the panel style joinery I used on the kitchen cabinet, I'm going to be using timber frame joinery for the desk. And while I'd love to sit down with a chisel and a handsaw and get real nerdy on you, I need to be practical about my choices so I can keep the pace up. Don't worry, I'm not about to pull out the pocket hole jig. I'm using half and cross lap joints. They're easy to cut, super repeatable, and you get to do this. The glue up is pretty dummy proof as well, so long as you measured right to start with. I've got four leg assemblies glued up, and then a couple of stretches to hold them all together. I'm going to build some drawers into this later, but for now I'm just going to finish up the framing Give everything a good sand and get some polyurethane on it. So that I can move on to the last lot of cabinets we need to make. I'm going to be building three overhead cabinets. Two smaller ones to go above the kitchen cabinet and the work desk and a larger one that runs the length of the sofa bed. The van is parked on a driveway that's slightly sloped so I need to give myself a relative reference to work off. I've run a string line between identical spots either side of the van, which will give me a horizontal reference. And now I can start templating up with cardboard to figure out the profile of the cabinet panels. I want to have fixture points on both the walls and the roof, so I need to work out where those roof battens should be positioned as well. I've mocked up the rough size so I can get a feel for them in the van. It's tempting to make all the storage as big as possible, but with these cabinets sticking out right at head height, I don't want to make it claustrophobic. Because at the end of the day, if the space isn't enjoyable to be in, it doesn't really matter how much stuff it can fit. So I spent the afternoon playing around with different sizes until I got something that felt about right. Then I fastened the battens to the roof where the cabinets will get screwed to. 
Using those cardboard mock-ups I'd made, I cut out all of the profiles and made some stretches for a more 12mm ply. I did consider using aluminium extrusions for the cabinets, like what I used during my laser cutter build series, but despite the significant advantage in weight, it's just too expensive for me to justify using it for this type of thing. And I'm pretty confident making the right choices with wood construction will do the job just fine. I marked where all the stretches would notch into and clamped them together so I could cut them out all at once. I don't always do it because I'm lazy, but when I do, I always find using masking tape when I'm marking out easier if I want to cut tight fitting joints. It just helps with making it extremely obvious where my saw cut is going and I'm way less tempted to stray over the line. To assemble the cabinets, I'm using glue and my cordless nailer. I'll be reinforcing everything later with metal corner brackets, so it just needs to hold itself together while the glue dries. For the bottom, I'm using 9mm plywood to save on weight, and that'll be plenty strong enough anyway. I'm leaving the panel a little large so that I can trim it up flush once the glue's dried. I'm using the same spring-loaded hinges I used on the gas stove cubby in the kitchen cabinet for the door fronts. And because I've got so many to do, I made myself a little guide jig so that I can batch them out. Let me just take a sip of my sawdust filled coffee and we'll trim off the overhanging bits. And it was about this point, right here, that I realized I was unhappy. While having the upward opening doors worked great on the two smaller overhead cabinets, because this one was that bit larger, the amount of weight in the doors was throwing everything out of whack, and I know it sounds very unscientific, but I just had a gut feeling it wasn't the way to go. So with the help of some more coffee, I had an idea that wouldn't slow me down too much. Let me just jump on the table saw and I'll show you what I'm thinking. I can mount these as tracks to make sliding doors. I don't know why I didn't think of it earlier, but it makes a ton of sense now. I can just use thin, lightweight panels and it doesn't even need any special hardware. So I'll get the bottom track installed and then I think it's time we hang these up in the van. But actually, before we do, I have something that'll be easier to do now before those cabinets go up. I want to make a shelf above the cab area, so I'm putting the headliner back in. I can't actually remember why I took it out to begin with, but it does make it easier to pack full of insulation. There's a surprising amount of gaps back here, which are perfect for all those offcuts of sheep's wool insulation from when I did the floors back in part one of this build. I'm having the same problem as when I mocked up the overhead cabinets. Because the van isn't parked on level ground, I can't use a laser level to get a horizontal reference line. I also don't own a laser level, so I'm just kind of clamping things to features that look level inside the van. I taped a couple of pieces of wood to the cardboard to help keep it flat, and then just scribed around the edges to get the shape. Then tracing the cardboard template onto 12mm plywood, and cutting it out. To hold the shelf in place, I'm going to hijack the mounting points for the grab handles and the coat hooks. And as we all know, things aren't perpendicular in the vans, so the brackets need to be gently persuaded otherwise. While they're drying, I'm going to add a front lip to the shelf, which is going to help stop things sliding out and act as a brace to stop any sagging. I use water-based polyurethane on the plywood and my oil-based wipe-on poly for the timber because it really makes that color pop. And once they're dry, I can glue them together in the most elaborate way possible. I also added a couple of tiny corner brackets to the inside for good measure. I'd like to add carpet to the underside of the shelf so that it matches the rest of the cabin, but for now I'll just make sure everything fits, and then I can come back to that later on in the build. Okay, with that all sorted, let's jump back into getting the overhead cabinets up. You'll remember I'm using sheet metal screws to fasten the battens to the steel of the van, but I haven't really tested how well they're actually holding, so of course the only logical thing is to try hanging 70 kilos of pure fury off a single screw to see if it fails. Strength test. Take one. Oh, that's actually really surprising. And even though I'm not planning on stashing any bodies in my overhead cabinets, I thought to be on the safe side I'd install rib nuts for the battens to bolt into. I also bought the Rivnut tool thinking I'd need it weeks ago and I really want to try it out. If you haven't heard of Rivnuts before, they do exactly what you think they do. They put a rivet in that's threaded like a nut, so it's perfect for sheet metal where you only have access to one side, but unlike a rivet, you're fastening with a bolt so you can attach and unattach things at will, which really aligns well with my fear of commitment. Alright, enough jokes, these cabinets aren't going to put themselves up. Here's the corner brackets I was talking about before, so the weight of the hanging cabinet is being transferred into the meat of the uprights, and not the weak nail and glue joint where the stretcher meets the upright. So as well as screwing all of those in along the top there, I also screwed the back stretches of the cabinet into the wall battens. 
And while I shouldn't be surprised how strong it all became, I am. <laughs> That's way more solid than I thought it was going to be. I shouldn't be surprised, but I kind of am. See? It was the exact same process with the cabinet that goes above the desk, which you can see I've got sitting in place there. And the last one is the little guy hanging out over the kitchen. I feel like I'm really making some progress now with all these cabinets up, so let's continue this momentum and get the ceiling up. Nice one. I need to put more roof battens up to support the ceiling panels, so I'm installing more rivnuts into the steel ribs of the van. It's pretty handy that they already have holes all through them from the factory, and there's a set running straight down the center of the van that are perfect for what I need. The only tricky bit with using rivnuts is transferring the whole locations to the batten. There's a bunch of different ways to do this, from making indentations with Play-Doh to stamping with wet paint. But in this case, I was able to clamp a batten in place and use a straight edge referencing the center line of the other holes in the roof ribs to mark a line. And so after drilling those holes through the batten, I could screw it in. My ceiling is going to be a little bit different than what you might have seen before, so let me explain my logic while I cut these pieces out. The roof of a van is not flat, it has a shallow arc shape to it, so whatever the ceiling is made from needs to be able to follow that curved profile, and I've seen this done mostly in two ways, by using strips of shiplap boards running lengthwise down the van, or thin plywood panels that can flex to the shape of the curve. But there's another shape that works really well over curved surfaces, triangles. I got the idea from 3D software that used mesh modeling, and I thought it might be a cool look for the ceiling panels. The silver strips that you can see attached to the plywood are aluminium extrusions for housing the LED strip lights. And while I'm not up to putting those in yet, I am going to use them as spaces to get my geometry correct. For the walls, I'm going to use normal rectangular plywood panels because I felt like having triangles everywhere might be a little much. Now if you're wondering about why the rest of the framing is only going up now after all the cabinets are in, it's so that I can clearly see where to add structure for attaching the ceiling and wall panels specifically. All of the cabinets are self-supporting so there's no point in having extra framing and wall panels running behind them as well. The cabinets that do have open backs at the moment, like the overhead ones, I'll be putting in some much thinner backing panels inside them to close them out from the van wall. If you remember back to my layout, I'd left this back corner of the van empty, mostly because I don't quite know what to do with it yet, and partly because I thought it'd be a good place to stow larger items. So to help with the latter, I'm installing this L-Track, which is used for taking tie-down anchors. And I'm bolting those through the steel of the van, and I can just reach my hand in behind to fit a nylock nut onto the back sides. I know it looks a bit jank now, but once all the wall panels are on, they'll be recessed between them and hopefully look okay. Alright, I'm back from a quick trip from the lumber yard and I've got myself a stack of 7mm or quarter inch pine plywood for the ceiling and wall panels. I'm going to start with cutting up the triangles for the ceiling since I'm most excited about seeing what that'll look like. I'm not sure if you can tell but I stacked three pieces on top of each other as I cut them so I only had to measure out the triangles once which was a nice wee time saver. And now I can start getting them all screwed into the ceiling frame. I started by doing the full size triangles, then working my way from the back, marking and trimming the more oddly shaped ones. I was 50-50 whether I was going to hate the triangles once I put them up, but I think they actually look kind of cool. I'm not sure I'd want them inside my house, but it is a unique look for inside a van. Yeah, I dig it. Before I get the wall panels up, I should probably figure out where all the outlets are going to be first. I'm going to put a 240 volt AC and a 12 volt USB outlet over the kitchen bench, another AC outlet over the desk near the back doors, and the battery monitor and another USB outlet at the head of the bed. There's nothing complicated about cladding the wall, just measure it up and cut it out. I'm keeping this simple and just screwing the panels into the framing. I ummed an art over the best attachment method to fasten the panels, and while I'd like to have completely hidden fasteners, I just couldn't justify the amount of extra effort to achieve that, so I'm hoping that if I do this neatly enough, it's still going to look tidy. Plus, leaving the screw heads exposed makes it really easy to take panels off to get access for maintenance, which, given this is a moving vehicle, it sounds like something that should be a high priority. Just so we're all holding the same end of the stick, what I'm planning on doing is getting all the panels fitted and installed, and then I'm going to take them out, 
paint everything all at once outside where I'll be able to lay the panels flat and it'll be a much more comfortable job. And while everything is out of the van, I'll run all the rest of the electrical wiring, do the plumbing and put the insulation in. And then I can bring everything back into the van finished for final assembly. Maybe this seems like a roundabout process, but it's just so I can lump all the similar tasks together and get everything finished at the same time. The last lot of panels are inset into the doors, which need to be fully templated out to get the curves right. In hindsight, I probably should have just slapped one large continuous panel over the top of the door, but apparently I'm a sucker for punishment. The smaller ones were a little easier though, as I could use baking paper to trace over the curves and the melting holes. And after installing a few rivet nuts, I could get them screwed down. I still had the door card that used to be on the sliding door, but it was in such bad shape, I ended up remaking that as well. I fitted the last couple of panels onto the ceiling, and with that, all the major construction in the van is now finished. Well, we got a lot done this episode, and I want to try to keep the pace up and get everything finished on this van for the next video. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this video, hitting that little thumbs up icon really helps me out with the algorithm and is much appreciated. I better get back to it, so I'll see you on the next one.